an opening statement, submit them for the record. And I recognize myself now for an opening statement. Thank you again, everyone, for attending the Education Workforce Committee organizing meeting. Welcome Ranking Member Scott and all of our new and returning members on both sides of the dais. I am hopeful we will have a productive Congress, and I look forward to working with all of you. Ranking Member Scott and I have always prided ourselves on being able to disagree without being disagreeable. Because of this, we have a great track record of bipartisan cooperation, but robust debate, and I hope we'll, that will lead us to create great legislation. The committee's jurisdiction is broad, from education and employment to health care and retirement. Our work affects every aspect of people's lives. That's why the work we do here is so important. Republicans are committed to protecting the rights of Americans to govern themselves. This starts in breaking up the control Washington has over education. The pandemic gave us a window into just how broken our K-12 education system is. I know everyone here cares deeply about giving our nation's students the best chance of success. Working together this Congress, I believe we can truly improve education and give all students the opportunities they deserve. Republicans are also ready to present real solutions to address the broken student loan system. We firmly believe there are ways to help borrowers while protecting taxpayers. We will also strengthen our workforce development programs. We must close our nation's skills gap and prepare the next generation of workers for our evolving economy. Workers are the backbone of our economy. Republicans are committed to ensuring all workers and job creators are given the chance to succeed. We will also focus on strengthening and expanding access to employer-sponsored health insurance. I look forward to the next two years and to everyone on this committee, get ready to work hard. You can't pick more rewarding work than looking out for the interests of students and workers. Before turning things over to Ranking Member Scott, I'd like to introduce the new Republican members. First, we have three members who are returning to the committee from after an absence on the committee, in addition to members who are continuing who were here last term. <clears throat> so those three members returning to the committee after an absence are Representatives Lloyd Smucker of Pennsylvania, Ron Estes of Kansas, and Julia Letlow of Louisiana. And we're excited to welcome them back to the committee. Now to our new members, Representative Kevin Kiley of California, Representative Aaron Bean of Florida, Representative Eric Burleson of Missouri, Representative Nathaniel Moran of Texas, Representative John James of Michigan, Representative Lori Chavez de Reamer of Oregon, Representative Brandon Williams of New York, and Representative Aaron Houchin of Indiana. So we welcome you to the Education and Workforce Committee. And now I'm happy to yield to my distinguished colleague from Virginia, the senior Democrat of the committee, Bobby Scott, for his opening remarks. Thank you, Dr. Fox, and congratulations on being elected to serve as the committee's leader. It's a pleasure to welcome members on both sides of the aisle to the committee. And as we formally begin our work in the 118th Congress, I want to take an opportunity to highlight significant progress we made in the last Congress on behalf of students, workers, and families. We added millions of jobs, reduced unemployment to historic low rates, saved over a million people's pensions, delivered historic funding for education, improved child nutrition, and brought the number of uninsured Americans uh, down to the lowest level ever. The committee also passed civil rights legislation, protected um, uh, against child and family violence. We supported uh, child care and early, early learning and school construction. And other important uh, legislation for families, workers, and students, including the PRO Act and Raise the Wage Act. In the 118th Congress, I remain committed to working with every member of the committee to achieve, to achieve the goals we share, ensuring that all people across the nation have access to quality education, good paying jobs, and affordable health care. Now, we may not always agree on the path of achieving those goals, but I think we will agree on working in good faith efforts and follow the evidence and research in developing policies that will improve the lives of people we serve. This committee has the authority and responsibility to address many issues facing our communities today. 
We first have the duty to ensure that every student has access to high quality education that allows them to first make up for time lost in the classroom due to the pandemic and to compete in the modern economy. We also have the duty to build on our historic economic pro uh, progress and empower workers so that we can continue to build the economy from the middle out and the bottom up. And importantly, we have the duty to protect and extend, expand access to affordable health care for people across the country. Regardless of the political differences and challenges that lay ahead, the American people are still counting on us to find common ground and advance policies that put people over politics. I want to thank, um, uh, I, want, I want to, are you going to introduce your ranking members next, uh, your, cha your chairs for now? Um, I'll, I'll, at, at this point, I'll, I'll yield back and um, introduce our new ranking members after you've introduced the chairs. Thank you. Uh, I also want to introduce the committee clerk, Kate Dillon. We'll hear from her quite a bit, and we look forward to working with her in this new role. I will introduce, um, would like to introduce now uh, Mary Miller from Illinois as the vice chair of the full committee. And uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the new chairs of our four subcommittees. Subcommittee on Early Childhood, Elementary, and Secondary Education will be chaired by Representative Aaron Bean from the 4th District of Florida. Subcommittee on Higher Education and Workforce Development will be chaired by Representative Burgess Owens from the 4th District of Utah. Subcommittee on Health, Employment, Labor, and Pensions will be chaired by Representative Bob Good from the 5th District of Virginia. Subcommittee, by Workforce, Subcommittee on Workforce Protection will be chaired by Representative Kevin Kiley from the 3rd District of California. I now yield to the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Scott, to introduce the subcommittee ranking members of the committee. The ranking members um, for the committee will be the general lady from Oregon, Ms. Bonamici, will be ranking member of early childhood, elementary, and secondary education. The gentlewoman from Florida, Ms. Wilson, will be ranking member of the committee, subcommittee on higher education and workforce development. The gentleman from California, Mr. Desanier, will be ranking member of the subcommittee on health, employment, labor, and pensions. And the gentlewoman from North Carolina, Ms. Adams, will be the ranking member of the Workforce Protection Subcommittee. I'd like also like to recognize the gentlewoman from Connecticut, Ms. Hayes, who was elected to be the vice ranking member of the, of the committee. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Scott. <clears throat> I welcome back all the members on your side of the aisle as well. We're glad to see everyone look forward to the work we'll do together. Without objection, the subcommittee assignments as set forth in the rosters made available to each of you in advance of the meeting will be inserted in the record and shall be approved. The committee will now proceed to the consideration of the rules for amendment. The committee print of the committee rules was made available to each of you, and without objection, the committee print will be considered as read and open for amendment at any point, and any amendment offered shall be considered as read. I now recognize myself for five minutes to explain the rules. As many of you have noticed, the committee name has changed once again to the Committee on Education and the Workforce. We make this change to reflect the fact that this committee represents everyone who works to earn a living. I believe all work is dignified, and I want to honor every hardworking man and woman. Each of us represents constituents in numerous lines of work, and I know we all want to serve them to the best of our ability. That starts by honoring them with the language we use. Another big change includes a return to regular order. During the 118th Congress, there will be no remote hearings or remote markups. I believe showing up to do the work of the American people is important. That's why I made it a point not to utilize the proxy voting system over the past two years. The best debate and deliberation take place when we're able to interact face-to-face -face in real time. It is also far easier to maintain decorum and orderly procedures with in-person hearings. The pandemic is over. It's time to return to regular order. I'll now recognize Mr. Scott for his remarks. Thank you, Madam, Thank you, Madam Chair. The rules package we have here is a straightforward uh, document. 
It recognizes the majority's prerogatives. It is not particularly fair to the minority, but it is no less fair to the minority than the rules package that I introduced in the last two Congresses, so <laughs> fair is fair. While we disagree on the number of subcommittees that we should have and what their names should be, these disagreements will not stop us from having an open debate on issues within the jurisdiction of the committee. Uh, there is one rules change that um, I think will have an adverse effect under the rules of the House for the 118th Congress and the regulations there too. The majority of this in this Congress has established a process that makes it difficult to be able to have witnesses testify, testify remotely before the committee. Now, I understand the motivation that the majority has in attempting to end all remaining vestiges of how we proceeded when we were in the majority, but there's but of all the different steps we took to limit transmission of COVID, allowing witnesses to testify remotely seems like one of the few that have obvious benefits above and beyond pandemic prevention. Uh, moreover, many committees, including this one, utilize technology to allow remote testimony even before the pandemic. And we were able to negotiate its use in a way that was beneficial in both ways, both to the witnesses and to the committee. However, by setting the incredibly high standards to justify remote testimony and then creating an elaborate process to approve its use, the 118th House rules have made it difficult to utilize remote witnesses. This change will have a profound effect on the fundamental right of the minority to call its own witnesses. In the 116th and 117th Congress, the ability to allow witnesses to participate in self-government without having to uproot their lives proves beneficial as we heard from a diverse set of witnesses from across the country. It isn't hard to imagine uh, the voices we silence by not allowing a remote testimony. Now, many people have challenges appearing in person, but Zoom makes those access issues irrelevant. Furthermore, a witness may test positive for, for COVID the day before a hearing. A disease that is still killing approximately 400 people a day in the United States COVID positive witnesses may be healthy enough to testify and responsible enough not to fly to come to the committee room. And we would hope this process would be flexible enough to allow them to still testify remotely on a short notice. Simply put, the person with the most expertise and willingness to testify before us may be someone prohibited for any number of reasons for doing so, but allowing for the remote testimony is just one way to ensure that we get the best information from the best witnesses. So I recognize that the House rule is not up for debate in the committee rules package, but I hope the chair will work with us if we request a remote witness because that witness is best for the hearing to affirmatively determine the necessity of remote participation of that witness and to affirmatively seek the majority leader's written approval for that witness to participate and to participate those witnesses to participate following the majority leader's approval. I would urge um, you, Madam Chair, and all of my majority colleagues to take the issue back to your conference, remembering the promises you made for open house, to open the house to, to, for all, and recognize that we could do that in a sensible way by, re, by easing the regulations on remote testimony. And with that, uh, Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Scott. Is there anyone else who seeks recognition? If no member wishes to, if no one um, seeks recognition uh, to offer an amendment, then the question is now on the adoption of the committee rules. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed by saying no. no. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes have it. The motion is agreed to. The committee rules are adopted. The chair notes for the record a quorum is present. I now recognize the vice chair of the committee, Mrs. Miller. Thank you, Chairwoman Fox. I ask unanimous consent that the staff be authorized to make necessary technical and conforming changes to the committee rules. Without objection, so ordered. The committee will now proceed to the consideration of the authorization and oversight plan. <clears throat> the committee print of the oversight plan has been provided to each of you 
and without objection, the committee print will be considered as read and open for amendment at any point. And any amendment offered shall be considered as read. I now recognize myself for five minutes to explain the oversight plan. But before I get into the oversight plan, I have a bittersweet announcement. Mandy Schomburg, the committee's chief counsel, is retiring after 20 years of public service. Mandy has served the committee under multiple chairs and has been instrumental in passing important legislation to help children and adults and students. Throughout the last two decades, Mandy was involved in nearly every major piece of education legislation. This includes legislation that reformed child nutrition laws, the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, the Scholarships for Opportunity and Results Act, the Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention Act, and so many more. I've also appreciated Mandy's dedication to holding the federal government accountable, no matter which party controls the White House. I have appreciated Mandy's tireless work, and she will be greatly missed. Let's give her applause. Could the chair yield? One more comment, and you can yield, and you can speak. I've been talking to her even up here now, trying to talk her out of retiring, but <laughs> yes. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. And as you indicated, uh, we're trying to run the committee when we have disagreements without being disagreeable. I can tell you one of the ways it makes that easiest is when staff gets along in a cooperative way. And uh, we've worked very closely with Mandy, and we'll miss her on this side of the aisle as well as on your side of the aisle, and I wish her well. Thank you very much. Um, Oversight will be a major priority for this committee in the 118th Congress, as it will be for all committees, I believe. The executive branch has gotten too comfortable bypassing the legislative process set up by the Constitution. As the people's representatives, we should all be willing to guard the authority granted to us by the Constitution, regardless of which party is in the Oval Office. As elected officials, we should be focused on ensuring that government agencies are run as efficiently as possible and in accord with congressional intent. Federal agency heads might as well get comfortable with this hearing room. They're gonna be here a lot. You can't have good governance without good oversight. And we intend to have both. The, the chair now recognizes the ranking member for any remarks, Mr. Scott. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. The Committee of Democrats will also will be working to um, counterbalance our Republican colleagues' proposed oversight plan. Regrettably, the House Republicans have announced that they will use their oversight authority in ways that do not focus on the most pressing issues concerning Americans. Instead, the committee should be prioritizing building on the historic progress we made in the 117th Congress. Thanks to the efforts of the Biden-Harris administration and the a majority in Congress, the critical investments made by the American Rescue Plan, Inflation Adjust Reduction Act, national uninsured rate has reached an all-time low. Um, we achieved that in early 2022. We also have the responsibility to continue this track record by ensuring that workers have affordable and comprehensive options rather than funneling them through junk plans that, uh, caught, that result in everybody paying more. We also have to work to ensure that the Department of Education is doing everything it can to make this administration is for to provide all of those who are eligible student loan relief and to general, it's for to provide all of those who are eligible with student loan relief and to generally make paying loans easier and more affordable. Many Democrats remain committed to monitoring how states are continuing to use federal funding, including COVID relief funds to address learning loss and help our students get the support that they need. Moreover, we have to continue working for workers' rights, uh, particularly the right to join a union. The labor movement has built the middle class, and today unions continue to secure higher wages, better benefits, and safer workplaces for American workers. It's no surprise that unions have the greatest public approval rating that they've had since 1965. Yet, despite unions' popularity and some recent organizing successes, the percentage of workers 
where unions fell to a new low in 2022. It's simply wrong to suggest that the balance of power is toward, tilted towards union. The opposite is true. Its deck is stacked against workers uh, interested in joining a union, and that's why Democrats will continue working to strengthen federal laws that protect workers' right to organize. Democrats will also work to maintain the separation of church and state as required by our Constitution. This means monitoring not only the current administration, but continuing to undo harm caused by, by the previous administration, which sought to redefine the victim of discrimination to be those not the victim of discrimination, the one being discriminated against, but the victim of discrimination being defined as the one who wants to discriminate and can't under present laws. In short, we should be exercising oversight by put, putting people over politics, not scoring political points, and the Democrats will continue working to that end. Um, Madam Chair, I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Scott. Um, does anyone else seek recognition? Okay. The question is now on the adoption of the authorization and oversight plan. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed by saying no. No. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes have it. The motion is agreed to. The committee rules are adopted. I'm sorry, the uh, oversight rule has been adopted. The authorization and oversight plan is adopted. The chair notes for the record a quorum is present. I now recognize the vice chair of the committee, Mrs. Miller. Thank you, Chairwoman Fox. I ask unanimous consent that the staff be authorized to make necessary and technical and conforming changes to the authorization and oversight plan. Without objection, so ordered. Um, I am seeing no hands raised to uh, have any comments. So without further business, the committee stands adjourned, and I look forward to seeing all of you soon. Thank you very much. God bless.